Good afternoon, my name is Garrett Sheehan. We will be getting started in just a moment. And good afternoon again. Uh, we will be getting started in just a moment. Uh, we will be getting in just a few moments. Thank you for joining us for our 226th annual meeting and awards. We're gonna give everyone just another couple of seconds to get in here and then we will get started. Everyone, thank you so much for joining us for our 226th annual meeting and awards. We are ready to begin our show. Pandemic hit, the business community has faced the pandemic by pivoting, innovating, responding to changing customer demands, protecting the health of customers and employees, making difficult decisions, and ultimately persevering through historic conditions. Here are a few exciting words from our businesses that have pivoted and demonstrated perseverance in the light of this pandemic. We're here to talk about our commitment to making sure Gilbert businesses survive the pandemic. There have been some challenging times, but our community has stepped up. We had one merchant who allowed several of the other merchants to sell wares in their store. Great example of collaboration. We look forward to coming out of the other side of the, this pandemic stronger and better than ever. It's always a great day to be in Gilbert. See, never before have we had this level of collaboration amongst providers. Hospital systems, post-acute care groups, physician groups, and managed care companies all working together to redefine healthcare and create a healthier tomorrow for those we serve. We're actively growing our business in the state of Connecticut. We create business applications related to robotic process automation, virtual and augmented reality. We're optimistic about our business and proud to be part of the innovative community of New Haven. And I'm optimistic about New Haven because if you look down there, we're seeing a beautiful Black Lives Matter sign and I love seeing social change in the right direction. The surprising COVID upsides were our ability to connect to more people than ever before due to all of our support groups and educational programs being online and virtual. Our seven walks being remote and virtual resulted in increased community engagement and also local awareness. The reason I'm optimistic about our business is because even during these troubling times, our business has been able to grow. And once we get past these times, I'm even more encouraged by our future growth potential. I'm at the Canal Dock Boathouse, where this weekend the musicians of the New Haven Symphony will be performing our first concert since March. It's an unlikely location for a classical music performance, but it's an example of the kind of ingenuity and resourcefulness that make the city of New Haven so great. I just want to say how heartened we are by the Greater New Haven community for all their support during the pandemic, from their well wishes to our staff and our patients, to the donations of masks and food and money. We just really saw how the community always rises to the occasion during the worst of times, and you all helped us think possible. We have a lot of reasons to believe that 2021 is going to be a great year. Um, throughout all the challenges of the pandemic, real estate and housing has been doing really well. We've got the best area, the best arts and culture, best restaurants, and the best housing. Am I optimistic about Albertus's future and New Haven's future? You bet I am. For 95 years, Albertus has been overcoming challenges and obstacles, adapting to bring its education opportunities to those who might not otherwise have them. That story is New Haven's story. I've seen New Haven rise above challenge and move forward in my tenure in this community. So absolutely, New Haven will thrive, Albertus will thrive. As a community, we're going to thrive. I agree with them. At Marrakesh, we embrace human potential. The quick response of our New Haven community 
government and business leaders in providing resources to ensure that our most vulnerable citizens were well taken care of and had the supplies that they need and that our frontline workers were recognized was truly overwhelming. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for our 226th annual meeting and our annual awards. Well, to say at least, it's been a challenging year for business. Uh, but business has responded, making difficult decisions, working harder, reinventing, innovating, and surviving. We celebrate that spirit today, and we do so with heavy hearts, understanding the devastation that the virus has caused. Today, we will recognize our members that have responded to the call, working on testing and taking care of the ill. We will shine a light on the organizations that are stepping up and changing their culture and are focusing on inclusive and equitable growth. And we will celebrate all of the businesses that are just making things happen and doing it with determination and optimism. We are so excited to have you with us today. Today's program is presented by Connecticut, Southern Connecticut State University and TD Bank. Our agenda includes recognition of board members, the state of the chamber, a keynote conversation, award ceremony, and our grand prize giveaway. So please stick around for that. I now officially call this meeting to order. I'm pleased to introduce Michael Labella, Market President for TD Bank, our co-presenting sponsor of today's event. Mike. Thank you, Garrett. Good afternoon. Wow, what a, what, a great, uh, what a great video. I, I, I heard the vi virtual applause all the way uh, to my house. But uh, again, on behalf of all of us at TD Bank, it's our pleasure to welcome you and to once again be a presenting sponsor of the Greater New Haven Chamber Annual Meeting and Business Leadership Awards presentation. I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate all of today's winners for their outstanding accomplishments. I, I do have to say personally that one winner, Claire's Cornucopia, is a personal favorite with the best fresh rolls and carrot cake in New Haven. And Claire will all be back in the office very soon. So uh, we look forward to coming back. I'm also proud to say that this is our 14th year of sponsoring this important event. And normally when I have the opportunity to talk about TD Bank, you know, it's about our lending programs, deposit and treasury products, and our philanthropic outreach, all of which are still going on. But as we all know, this year is different. There's, there's an old quote that says, there are decades when nothing happens and weeks where decades happen. This is certainly the latter. But with all the pain the pandemic has caused, I'm convinced that good will come out of it. You know, we learned from 9-11 what we needed to do to secure our physical plant and technology. We learned from the Great Recession how to shore up the financial services industry. And we're learning from the pandemic that business dynamics and the economic environment can change rapidly and without any warning. We learned how to effectively mobilize a remote workforce, change and develop new technology quickly, and plan for potential future events. At TD, literally over a weekend, we built a new technology platform which allowed us to process over 86,000 PPP loans nationally, over 3,800 in Connecticut, and over 1,100 here in New Haven County, the vast majority of which were to small businesses. We have witnessed the power of small business ingenuity and tenacity, which is why I'm confident that we will come out of this stronger. I also wanna take this opportunity to thank Garrett again for his leadership and I look forward to today's presentation and confident that next year we will be together in person. Thank you. Hey, Michael, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Our other co-presenting sponsor is Connecticut, and it's my pleasure now to introduce Brian Pagliaro, Senior Vice President, Chief Sales and Marketing Officer for Connecticut. Brian. Thank you, Garrett. Uh, again, I'm Brian Pagliaro, the Chief Sales and Marketing Officer at Connecticut. Uh, Connecticut, as you folks know, uh, is born and bred right here in Connecticut. So we're very pleased. Uh, we have something very special. We think our brand is very special in Connecticut. Besides providing the highest level quality of service, operational performance, uh, we, we have a, a part of our special brand is that the people that we serve are our neighbors, our family, our friends. In this particular upside down time, it may be even more important than ever. Because uh, we are all here. Our employees are all here in the state of Connecticut. So the people who work with providers and the people who pay claims and the people 
who answer the phones for customer service. We reside here, we work here, we're with our family and our friends and service our family and our friends here in the state of Connecticut. So having said that, Connecticut is very proud to be a co-sponsor of the 226th annual Greater New Haven Chamber of Commerce meeting. I wanna congratulate the Business Leadership Awards winners and the University of New Haven as it celebrates 100 years of service. An institution that my dad graduated from 73 years ago. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, we appreciate all the support from Connecticut. We are also grateful today for the following organizations who have helped to make today's program a success. They are our media sponsors, La Voz Hispana, New Haven Register, our print sponsor, Tyco Print and Promo, video sponsor, Owen Co Media. They put that great video together at the beginning. Trophy sponsor, Fresh Concepts, powered by Halo. Our event sponsors, the HR Source, Omni New Haven Hotel at Yale, which is where we were hoping to be. Uh, and I know we will be there again very soon for another one of these major events. Now, throughout the pandemic, our state has been led by Governor Ned Lamont. He joins us now, along with our sponsor, Global Partners, and their CEO, Eric Slifka. Global is a company that you may not be familiar with, but they have a huge footprint in Connecticut. And Eric will tell us more and introduce the governor. Eric, uh, thank you so much. And uh, thank you to the Greater New Haven Chamber. Um, you know, the chamber uh, in Connecticut and New England, uh, Connecticut has, uh, you know, clearly been a, a leader uh, as chambers go across and throughout New England. Uh, my name's Eric Slifka, I'm president and CEO of Global Partners. Just a, a little bit of history. Uh, we're family business, you know, we, we, we happen to be a Fortune 300 company, um, but uh, the business started uh, with my grandfather and grandmother. Uh, he bought a, a, a heating oil truck and he started delivering heating oil in the 30s. Uh, during the Great Depression. And um, we've expanded that business to now be from the Mid-Atlantic uh, to, to Maine. And uh, we've got about 3,800 employees of which uh, we have uh, an office uh, in Connecticut of roughly uh, 680, uh, 680 employees in total throughout the state. Um, but I wanna talk uh, just a little bit about the nature of our business and uh, the essential services that it provides uh, to the state and to the consumers uh, throughout Connecticut. So by example, uh, we supply and operate the convenience stores and the gas stations that are located on the 95 corridor in Connecticut and the Merritt Parkway. Um, and uh, the key really is this is base infrastructure uh, that allows us to deliver diesel and to deliver, to deliver gasoline to those first responders, those who serve the communities. We also have C stores throughout uh, many of the cities and towns uh, in the state of Connecticut. We just opened two new sites in Hamden uh, and Waterbury. We spent about $5 million in capital on each site. But the key is these are local facilities, local marketplaces, delivering basic services and needs to those communities. And the stores are each about four to 5,000 square feet. Um, but the key here is, is people feel comfortable coming there. Uh, and it's as simple as getting a cup of, a cup of coffee or f filling up your truck with diesel. And that truck can be for just day-to-day -day services or, or it can be uh, you know, diesel that maybe ultimately is, is gonna go and serve uh, you know, a hospital or the community at large. We also have terminal operations uh, through the state of Connecticut in Bridgeport and Weathersfield. Um, and we have uh, facilities in New Haven as well that we lease. Um, these also provide those base services uh, during uh, the most critical moments uh, in, the, uh, in the industry. But I don't wanna to take too much time um, talking about global. I wanna thank uh, the governor uh, and the state for all they've done supporting us and designating us as essential services uh, throughout these last six months of COVID. Um, we appreciate all, uh, all of that help that you've given us and allowed us to do our job. 
and to be uh, really good to deliver services in the communities that we're at. So without uh, further ado, I want to um, I want to uh, introduce Governor Ned Lamont, and Ned was sworn in uh, as Connecticut's 89th governor in January of 2019. Uh, before leading the state, Governor Lamont was an entrepreneurial business leader who started his own company, taking on large and established giants in the telecom industry. Uh, under his vision and stewardship, the company grew to serve over 400 of America's largest college campuses and 1 million college students across the nation. Uh, for the past year, he's courageously led the state through the coronavirus pandemic in one of the most challenging times in the history of Connecticut. During this time, Governor Lamont fought to maintain the important balance between economic activity and prioritization of health and safety for all of Connecticut's residents. That early and sustained leadership has brought impactful results as Connecticut continues to have one of the lowest infection rates among all states in the nation and helps, has helped us reach the phase three reopening. During this time and including before the pandemic, Governor Lamont has been laser focused on improving the state's economy and the economic development efforts, which has proven critical as the state recovers. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor to uh, welcome Governor Ned Lamont. Thank you. Hey, well said, Eric, and hey, Garrett, and hello, everybody. Um, just talking to Eric for a minute beforehand, I mean, your, your company is um, a leading indicator in some ways about what's going on in our economy, where you said that, uh, you know, obviously we got hit hard, and that was also reflected in, um, you know, fuel deliveries to gas stations going back six months. And now, six months later, I think you said, we're going to be 85, 90% back. And um, I'd say that um, is a little bit where our economy is right now as well. Uh, look, let's face it, we were hit hard. We were part of that uh, New York ecosystem coming right down uh, I-95, right down the Merritt Parkway, or right where all your um, service stations are, Metro North Corridor. And you could see, uh, uh, you could see COVID sort of um, just in a heat map coming right down. Over the last six months, ever since we started opening our economy, and as you point out, Erica, we kept about um, most of our economy open all throughout. The essential services you pointed out, outdoor um, construction, manufacturing, those were places where we thought we could, um, A, were vital, and B, we could control access and do it safely. That gave us a head start in terms of getting our economy back. So. Today, we have more of our economy back, I think, than just about anybody else in the Northeast and a little above average around the country, which is, um, which is a good thing. Unemployment is lagging, though, because a lot of our service economy was hit hard. So while restaurants can be open at 75%, they're not operating at 75%. While movie theaters can open at 75%, they're maybe opening at 10% right now. Just you have to build the consumer's confidence to get back and we have to do it safely, convince people we're putting uh, public health uh, front and center. I can tell you, broadly speaking, um, you know, we are one of the only states in the country to end last fiscal year, June 30, with a, uh, a surplus, which is a good thing. And we also began paying down our long-term pension obligations. I don't want to overstate it. We put did about 70 million, and uh, let's say we have closer to 70 billion in outstanding obligations, and that's a problem. Um, we're dealing with, but uh, we made a start, something that has never happened in this state before. So today we've got about 98% of our economy technically open uh, and consumers are slowly getting back to work, comma, provided that we can keep um, control over COVID. And as you know, there have been a number of flare ups um, around the region, now including Connecticut, and that is hitting what they call our positivity rate. That's the percentage of people tested who test positive for COVID. Uh, and you saw that in Danbury, you saw that in Norwich, we're seeing that in New London, maybe a little more in Southeast Connecticut uh, right now. And um, I don't wanna say I've seen this movie before, but I see flare ups in Brooklyn and Queens. I remember back seven months, I see uh, places like Boston, I think have a positivity rate, you know, two or three times what we're doing here in Connecticut. So. <clears throat> we worry because we're a region. There's not necessarily um, strong borders. But I want to also give you a little bit of confidence. Um, that is that we as a country and we as a state are so much better prepared than we were, um, you know, six, eight months ago. 
We've got um, all the PPE stockpiled warehouse. There was no stockpile in Washington, by the way. We were um, scrambling. We just kept ahead of the curve back in April. Now we've got a good supply, which makes a difference. Tons of testing capacity. Remember back then we could test maybe 10 or 15 people a day, just those that had flown in from Wuhan or something. We had to be very uh, strict about it. Those going into uh, the hospitals. Today we're doing symptomatic and asymptomatic testing on a broad basis. And that allows us to see uh, flare ups very early, almost before they're happening. Allows us to go in with a cavalry, allows us to go in with a track and trace team, figure out where people are, get them quarantined. And it's working to some degree. I mean, if Danbury went up like this, it's now going down as we've um, you know, put in place. Norwich went up fast, it's beginning to go down. New London were very uh, early stages, but um, as you know, if flare ups keep coming in from out of state, it's something we have to watch as well. Uh, and I just want to do everything I can, uh, leading with public health, to do, to give consumers confidence that uh, when you get back to work, when you get back to the store, when you get back to school, um, it's something you can do safely. And I'll just leave you with a thought that a Connecticut, more than just about any other state in the region, does have its kids going back to school uh, on a full-time basis for about a third of the elementary school kids and on a hybrid basis for almost everybody else. And um, I can't tell you that we're not going to have another flare up in late October, November. I mean, that's sort of what happened back in the uh, 1918 Spanish flu pandemic. But I can tell you um, every day we can keep our businesses open and every day we can keep our schools open, I think is a good day for those kids. And since this is the New Haven Chamber, I, I will leave you with one thought. Um, you're, uh, you and Danbury and Norwich are the three cities where it's uh, just remote learning right now. And um, I think that's, uh, that's too bad for a lot of kids who could use some of that personal face-to-face uh, -face, uh, connection with their friends as well as their teachers. And we're finding around the rest of the state that, yep, there are some um, issues in and around schools, but 90% of them come from what's going on um, out, outside of school. The classroom is one of the safest places to be. Kids are wearing the mask. Teachers are wearing the mask. We've got um, the Binax, you know, instant testing going on right now, so we can tell whether it's a um, a bad case of uh, the sniffles or it's COVID. We know who has to be quarantined and who doesn't. And those are the type of therapies uh, that are going to be the bridge to the vaccine, which I'm afraid won't be around before the uh, election, but will be around, I think, early next year. And uh, then it's a matter of convincing people to do it. So. I'd say the jury's out in terms of where we are in COVID and the economy. I think we're doing um, pretty well compared to our peers on the economy um, and in terms of COVID, but uh, only if you continue to be really strict about uh, following the protocols, which keep us safe. Thanks, Garrett. And thank you, Governor. We appreciate you taking the time to speak with us. And now it's my pleasure to introduce the mayor of New Haven, Justin Elliker. And uh, this is Mayor Elliker's first time addressing the business community here at the chamber. And Mayor, on behalf of all of the members in our organization, we appreciate your service. Uh, thanks, Garrett. Uh, first time for, um, for me for a lot of the first time uh, working through a pandemic as well. Uh, it's been pretty, uh, a pretty wild um, eight or nine months. Um, and Governor, I think we need to get you a new painting because I don't think that was New Haven behind you in that picture. So um, uh, we should talk offline. Uh, Garrett, uh, the 226th annual meeting, I, I believe that you said that number, that is amazing. I suspect this is probably by far the most unusual meeting that uh, you've ever had. I uh, want to give you uh, uh, kudos for not having any technical difficulties yet. I've been at a lot of uh, Zoom and these types of meetings, and uh, it's it's been very very smooth so far. So congratulations. Uh, we're we're obviously going through very very challenging times right now. Uh, our economy is faltering. In inequality is exacerbated, and uh, cases are yet going up again. And um, of course, we all have many sad stories uh, to share about the difficulties that uh, our community is going through. Um, at the same time, uh, I've seen so many inspiring stories as well. Uh, people helping out their neighbors, nonprofits stepping out, churches volunteering to distribute food, donate, uh, and support their communities. Uh, and there's been a lot of very, very positive economic stories as well. Uh, there's been new businesses opening up in New Haven. 
large projects like uh, 101 College are moving forward to full steam ahead. And uh, from our economic development office, I get news on a regular basis of uh, new people interested in investing in the economic future of the city, even in these uh, very difficult and challenging times. Uh, today's an opportunity to celebrate the work of so many of the leaders in the community. And uh, those leaders are ensuring that New Haven and the region are vibrant and strong, even in these difficult times. And over the years, just looking at the list, I've gotten to know so many of the honorees and speakers that will be recognized today. Uh, I admire you, we admire you, and we thank you for your contribution. There's obviously a lot more work to be done. And I did wanna take one moment to um, highlight in particular uh, issues around equity and social justice. There's, there's clearly been an outcry around the nation to address the inequalities that have existed for centuries around the nation and also in our region. And we have a lot of work to do in this area. And frankly, I think we have to think a lot deeper about the role of our business community, our largest employers, and ourselves. Um, the role that we play to take truly deep, meaningful, uh, significant steps towards an equitable society. And I think this extends from who we hire uh, in our businesses to a willingness to increase options to affordable housing. Uh, to making meaningful investments uh, to address those equity, uh, inequities in the city. I, I think we're all very realistic about uh, what we're facing in the coming months. Um, we're not out of the woods by any means with the pandemic. Uh, we've seen those cases go up yet again. Uh, it's clear that our economy will continue to face serious economic challenges that are likely to worsen in the coming months. But when I think about New Haven, uh, this community, our entrepreneurial mindset, creative approaches to new problems, and a history of bouncing back. I'm left with a sense of hope, a sense of optimism, and dedication to the work that needs to be done. And I know the leadership of the chamber feels the same way. I'm looking forward to uh, partnering with you all uh, in the many uh, coming days and months as we, uh, we navigate through this difficult time. So thank you uh, so much for your partnership. Mayor, thank you so much for joining us. Now we do have some business to take care of at today's annual meeting. So it's my pleasure to introduce Michael Schaefer, CA White, and also the longtime chair of our nominating committee. Mike. Th thank you, Garrett. Uh, I see you're using uh, my picture from the first uh, annual uh, chamber <laughs> meeting 226 years ago. So uh, thank you for using that one. Uh, uh, not my uh, present uh, photo. So uh, I want to thank the uh, other members of the nominating committee for all their help in putting this year's slate together. Obviously a far more complicated year than most. And when we get to it, we're going to have a virtual vote on the new slate that everybody uh, will be asked to participate in. And uh, you'll do it through the chat uh, vehicle uh, on uh, this uh, Zoom meeting. Uh, and this is probably the first and only time I hope that we have to do it this way. But again, this is a year when elections are challenged and people are gonna be voting by mail and other vehicles. So this is just another way that you can vote. Uh, so I, uh, I, I'll go over that when we get to the point of uh, uh, putting the slate into a motion for approval. Uh, I also, before we get started with the slate of new members to the Board of Directors, I wanna recognize those members of the um, Board of Directors that will be stepping down after serving uh, a series of uh, three uh, consecutive uh, terms uh, on the Board of Directors. And you see, uh, presumably you all see it, uh, quickly go over, Jody Amatuli, uh, uh, Helene Augustine, uh, Thomas Bernie III, Elena Cahill, Joe Ferriolo, uh, Peter Gazzotti, uh, Hugh Mankey, Len Matteo, Vince McDermott, uh, Joe Nuzzo, Paul Portnoy, Joy Rogers, and Steve Aleko. And again, I want to thank those members that have been serving for three terms uh, for all of the service that they provided uh, to the chamber. And we wish you well, and we always want to keep you guys involved uh, and participating in the chamber events. And uh, we would love to cycle you guys back on when the time is appropriate. And thank you for your service. Now I'd like to um, recognize 
those members of the chamber board that are going to be serving for an additional term, each term is uh, three years, and we permit uh, chamber members to serve for three consecutive terms of uh, three years each. And so let me go over the list of those that will be serving for an additional three year term. Um, to start with, Mark Candido of Newtown Savings Bank, Mary Ellen Cody of Community, uh, Gateway Community College, Leo Connors of Janney, Montgomery and Scott, Dean Ellen Dernan of Southern Connecticut State University, Terry Guidon, Connecticut, Dean Brian Kench, University of New Haven, Kevin LaChapelle, Whittlesley, Rich Medeiros, New Haven Register and Hearst Media, Chris Philip Onofrio, Langan, John Setti, Comcast Business, Carolyn Welsh, Chelsea Groton Bank, Joseph Williams, Shipman and Goodwin, and Lauren Zucker of Yale University. And, and I want to thank those for their willingness to continue serving on the board for an additional term. Next, I'd like to recognize those individuals that will be serving uh, their first term on the board. Some of these are people that have been on the board before and are cycling back on the board. To start with, uh, Kellyanne, Kelly Wade Bertucci of AT&T, Connecticut. Christina Fitzgerald of the Union League Cafe. Carolyn Gonzalez, Capital for Change. Howard Hill, Howard K. Hill Funeral Services, who will also uh, uh, be our vice chair and we'll recognize him as well as the other officers uh, at the end of the nominating process. Jeff Hubbard of Liberty Bank and Michael Labella, our, our sponsor, TD Bank. Additionally, we have Chris, Chris Lee LaHaye, Global A, and George Lado of Alexion, David Mons of Updike Kelly and Spellacy, Mark Nisbet, People, Places, and Spaces, Juan Salas Romer, NHR Group, and Allison Standish Plimpton of Key Bank. And I thank all of them for their willingness to serve for a first term on the Board of Directors. Now I want to get to the actual voting process. And um, I will ask all uh, those members that are present uh, to vote through chat. First off, I need someone to nominate this slate. Do I hear a nominee for, uh, uh, for this slate? Is, uh, who's willing to put this slate in motion? And someone needs to, all right, great. We see Tom Sansone, and do I have a second? And I have a second. Great, thank you. All those in favor, please vote aye. All right, see we actually have a, a panel. Uh, we have a poll. We're doing it through a poll. So please vote on the on the poll if you can. Great. The eyes have it. Thank you all for your willingness to participate and thank you for your vote in approving the slate. I also want to recognize the uh, officers of the board of directors the board of the chamber votes prior to the annual meeting on the officers for the coming year and i want to recognize and and and, and honor those that are are going to serve as our officers for the coming year jeff klaus chair howard k hill as vice chair jeff solomon as treasurer kevin doherty as secretary and Jennifer Morgan Del Monaco, media past chair. And again, thank you all for your willingness to support and to lead this organization. With that, I'd like to, it is my pleasure to introduce the chair of the board, Jeff Klaus. Thank you, Michael, very much. And good afternoon, uh, Greater New Haven Chamber members and friends. I'd like to offer a uh, congratulations to all the award recipients today. Well, what a difference a year makes. Who would have thought we'd be meeting like this? Uh, one thing is for sure, um, we cannot predict the future with any accuracy. Um, having said that, I would like to make a prediction, um, and it's recorded. So 
Uh, I hope it doesn't come back to bite me. But despite the havoc that this virus has wrought across the globe, and despite the economic and social disruption that we've all experienced, I predict that our region in particular will not only rebound, but we will flourish in a post-COVID world. And while no one can safely predict the timing, it's definitely a when and not an if that we will return to some kind of normalcy. And when we do, our New Haven region is very well positioned to not just recover or rebound, but actually, I think, be strengthened by this experience. I think we need to consider our core economic assets when I make that prediction. We are home to a world-class university. From a business and economic perspective, which all of you share, Yale University is a major global exporter of knowledge. We are a hub for life science, research and development, and increasingly commercialization. We have a top-notch and growing health system that increasingly exports its knowledge and expertise by attracting patients and professionals from an ever-broadening geography, and I'm happy to say we're gonna hear from Arna Borgstrom uh, shortly. We have a livable, walkable, bikeable, vibrant urban center that appeals to city dwellers, um, but it's also on a scale that I think will attract people who have recently made the decision to move away from the big cities. And we have easy access to two global 24-7 cities and communities with some of the finest and most beautiful recreation spots on the entire East Coast. So I think our post-COVID future looks very bright. So how is the Chamber prepared to promote commerce and economic prosperity now and in the future? Well, in a number of ways. First, I'd like to thank uh, my amazing predecessor in this role, Jen Delmonico, uh, who was able to lead and attract a president of incredible energy and talent to the chamber uh, over two years ago. And under Garrett Sheehan's leadership, we have not just survived and become an indispensable partner to local businesses during COVID, but we also completed a refresh of our strategic plan that focuses like a laser beam on helping our members achieve success in business. The plan incorporates two very important themes throughout. The first is recognizing that we are not 15 or 16 little fiefdoms all competing against each other for economic resources, company headquarters, or jobs. You've all seen that. But instead, we view ourselves as a single powerful economic region which will flourish only by coordinating and working together. The other major element that you will find in the plan is a commitment that for our chamber to, to succeed and for our economy to succeed, we need to be reflective of the diversity of all people, communities, and businesses in our region, including those that have historically been underrepresented at the chamber. So to that end, we are seeking out and listening to all the diverse voices in our region so that we can promote a more inclusive local economy. Because as you all know, greater participation in commerce by a greater number of our residents creates a more robust and more sustainable prosperity for all of us. We are all in this together. Now, this is a special passion for our new vice chair, Howard Hill. Howard recognizes the obvious benefits of a growing pie for all, and he comes into the vice chair role with a perspective that most of our members can recognize that of a founder and an owner of a small business, Howard K. Hill Funeral Services. So I'd like to end by thanking you all for your virtual attendance today, your enduring commitment to your chamber, and your shared vision of a growing and prosperous greater New Haven community. Thank you very much. Let's bring in Howard K. Hill now. Howard? Great, thank you, very, uh, thank you, Garrett. Uh, thank you, Jeff, for those kind words. Uh, and good afternoon and welcome to our 226th annual meeting. My name is Howard K. Hill. I am a licensed funeral director here in the state of Connecticut, uh, in New Haven, Hartford, and also Bloomfield, Connecticut. Uh, been in the business for well over 23 years uh, and very, very philanthropic and committed to my community. Uh, I echo uh, many of the sentiments of uh, Jeff uh, and also Mayor Elliker. Uh, and I wanted to uh, express my profound gratitude uh, for your confidence that you have placed in me. Uh, 
and I certainly look forward uh, to working with the chamber and its members to usher in a new uh, community, business community that is mo most inclusive uh, and equitable for all businesses. Thank you so very much, and we're looking forward to our work. Thank you so much, Howard, and we are so honored to have you serve in this role. Uh, now, I want to let everyone know that at the end of the program, we will be giving away our sit and stay and play in the New Haven region grand prize. This is presented by American Green Fuels. Please stick around. As you can see, it's an incredible package, but you must be virtually present uh, to be able to win. Well, every year I have the opportunity to deliver uh, to our members the state of the chamber. And I don't need to say this to you, but this has been a year unlike any other. Uh, as Jeff mentioned back in December 2019, the chamber board approved a new strategic plan. We thought we'd be spending uh, all of our time trying to implement that plan. Well, it turns out we have, but just not the way uh, that we expected it to happen. Uh, the strategic plan was intended as a way to bring the chamber forward, to keep pa pace with the ever-changing business landscape. And we have been able to do that, but just that lightning speed over the last several months. Some of those key thoughts, we want to better serve our businesses. And that was no more evident than at the beginning of this pandemic, uh, when we were doing webinars, talking with our business members about PPP and how can they apply for these different dollar pools that, they're, that are out there. We want to be more engaged with all of you, all of our members. So we did that. We were on the phone reaching out and we found out even after we got through that first round of PPP, it was more incumbent on us to reach out to you and find out how your business was going, how we could help and become more digital. Uh, we have had nearly 60 webinars. We're bringing in new tools and hopefully you're seeing more video and more social media from us overall. Now we have two focus areas that were in the strategic plan. There are many, but uh, two that I wanna focus on. First, economic development. Last year, we received a grant from the Regional Water Authority for an economic development position. Now, since then, we have completed more than 82 business outreach visits. Those visits have resulted in more than 150 new connections to resources, seven economic development projects, and a more cohesive approach to economic development with our partners. And I really do want to say economic development, it's a team sport. We have a great team here in this region. It's working with all of our towns, with the Economic Development Committee, uh, Rex, and I want to thank Ann Benowitz, who is our Economic Development Director. Another focus area was inclusive growth. But over the last several years, Chamber has made, I would say, tremendous strides. But this summer, we realized we needed to change our approach and do a lot more. Some of that is here today. We hope that this event will be a spotlight on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Our Diversity and Inclusion Council has done an incredible job of bringing people together to the table and highlighting best practices. We're also working on creating new partnerships and in many cases being a convener for dialogue around change. We will not shy away from being involved in this conversation and we want you to know that. Uh, we have a lot more work to do, but as you heard from Howard, we will uh, find ways to get it done and we will work closely with all of our partners. And I just realized I was looking at the wrong camera, but now you can see me uh, looking at the right one. Um, I don't want to sugarcoat it. It's been an extremely difficult year for the chamber, and that's because it's been a very difficult year for business. I want to thank Jeff Klaus, Jeff Solomon, our treasurer for their constant support the board, our investors, always willing to help us, the grant funders who believed in us, everyone at the Quinnipiac Chamber that we work so closely with, and finally our staff, they've made sacrifices to make all of this work. I really do wanna thank our staff. They've done so much and we've asked a lot of them. The good news is that in the last two years, we've had surpluses. And so when our fiscal year ended on February 29th, uh, we were in a position to be able to continue to go strong. And that's exactly what we needed to do. And it's what we've done. We've gone through this. Yes, we see the challenge and danger, but we also saw a moment when the chamber was needed most. And I am uh, so proud that we have been able to be there for all of you. We have a lot of work to do. We've done some good things, but that's all for naught if we don't continue to be the support system for the business community as we still face several more months of uncertainty. We will continue to be more digital. We are continuing to invest in technology, be an advocate for you as we continue to deal with restrictions and rules that may change as things go on. And also as we rebuild, we're committed to economic development and now working on a new initiative to deliver talent to our businesses. 
We're looking for new ways to connect virtually and in person as much as we safely can, and we are committed to inclusive growth. We believe in business because business is people. It's you. The people who make up this community have shown they will persevere, and even more, they will thrive. We believe in you, and we appreciate your continued support of the Chamber of Commerce. At the Chamber, we are very fortunate to have the support of our investors. We have three tiers. First, our premier investors, our key investors, and all of our principal investors. We could not do it without the support of these organizations that you are seeing on the screen. That's the case in a normal year, but especially here in 2020. And now we'll hear remarks from our speaker sponsor. I am very pleased to be joined by James Barger, market president for KeyBank, who will introduce Marta Borgstrom. Jim. Thank you, Garrett. It's a pleasure to be here, even if it is remotely. While we've become pretty adept at the virtual business meeting in these last few months, I look forward to the time when we can once again do these events in person. Let me start by congratulating and thanking Allison Standish Plimpton, KeyBank's business banking leader, for her appointment to the Greater New Haven Chamber's Board of Directors. Our bank has been a long-standing presence in the New Haven business community and in the leadership of this chamber. We are proud to have Allison continue that legacy. She has strong business acumen and a passion for helping businesses achieve their goals, and I'm confident the chamber, the business community, and KeyBank will be served by her leadership. What a year it's been. One year ago, I addressed this chamber and introduced myself to all of you. At that time, none of us had any idea what we would be facing in this community one year later. The public health challenges of this continuing pandemic and its economic impact disrupted and shuttered businesses, job losses, and changes to the way all of us work today, social unrest and divisive politics, even natural disasters in other parts of the country that may be impacting our businesses here. But my message about Key Bank is the same today as it was a year ago. We are about helping our customers and communities thrive, and that is true in good times and bad. I'm extremely proud of Key Bank's retail branch colleagues who, as essential workers, have been on the job every day helping individuals, family, and businesses weather this perfect storm of financial challenges. They've made our branches safe for clients who want to come in to do business with us and offer state-of-the-art mobile, online, and mobile services for those who don't. I'm also proud of our business banking and commercial banking teams who process 40,000 PPP loans to help businesses keep jobs across the country. And right now, we are walking, working with each of these companies to get their loans forgiven through the SBA. From a community standpoint, KeyBank pivoted much of our plan 2020 community investments under our five-year $16.5 billion community benefits plan to support those impacted by COVID-19 in all of our markets, including Connecticut. In addition, KeyBank donated an additional $1 million in local COVID relief efforts across our markets in March, and another $1 million for local social justice and racial equity initiatives in May. Of course, KeyBank isn't doing anything more than what you and your businesses are doing, supporting our community to the best of our ability. It's a very overused phrase, but still very true and powerful. We are all in this together. And Key is proud to be arm in arm with your businesses helping our community. One organization that is at the top of Greater New Haven's community support efforts is Yale New Haven Health Services. I have the distinct honor of introducing its CEO and today's keynote speaker, speaker Marna Borgstrom. Marna began her career at Yale New Haven Hospital more than 40 years ago. She has been CEO of Yale New Haven Hospital and president and CEO of Yale New Haven Health since 2005. Her community board service is extensive, providing leadership to the Health Institute, the Coalition to Protect America's Healthcare, the Connecticut Hospital Association, New Haven Promise, and others. Her awards and recognitions are many, including the AHA Grassroots Champion Award, the Ant Anti-Defamation League Torch of Liberty Award, the Greater New Haven Chamber of Commerce Community Leadership Award, and Business New Haven's Business Person of the Year. The critical importance of Yale New Haven Hospital to the health and well-being of our community cannot be overstated. We are extremely grateful for the steadfast commitment of Yale New Haven's nurses, physicians, and entire staff to its patients, their families, and the communities they serve. I'll let Marna tell you more about the tremendous asset Yale New Haven Health is to our community. 
Ladies and gentlemen, Marna Borkstrom. Thank you. So thank you, thank you uh, very much, Jim. And uh, let me begin by offering uh, my appreciation to the Greater New Haven Chamber and to all of you for the opportunity to spend a few minutes with you today. And on certain times like these, the leadership of this chamber truly stands out. Vin Petrini, one of my uh, senior staff members who's well known to the chamber, recently said that there are easy challenges, there are tough challenges, and then there's 2020. And I think we've heard the speakers today all reference that. Uh, this year has offered us all more curveballs than we could have imagined. And I suspect like most of you, uh, you wanna see 2020 in our collective rearview mirrors before too long. Today's event is yet another virtual showcase that I'm sure we're all a little bit tired of. When we normally would have been gathered uh, in the ballroom at the Omni, uh, and while sometimes uh, I didn't always look forward to those, I would love to be with all of you in person and having an opportunity uh, to hug and shake hands. Uh, but in spite of all that we've been through, um, uh, we understand that the role of the chamber has never been more important uh, than it is today and uh, offer our great appreciation to Garrett Sheehan and his entire team for keeping us together and for organizing, uh, I think as um, others have said, what seems to be a virtually flawless uh, event here. Over the course of my more than 40 years at Yale New Haven, I've had the rare privilege to learn from and walk among some of the most extraordinary people anywhere. Never has that been more evident than in the response of our physicians, nurses, other frontline caregivers, and many others who support them uh, and supported all of us as we responded to the unprecedented threat of COVID-19. As the world as we knew it came to a crushing halt nine months ago, the heroes among us, the men and women of our healthcare systems put themselves at risk daily to meet the needs of those afflicted by the novel coronavirus or other related health emergencies. They stood tall and they sacrificed so much to serve their patients and their communities. And I couldn't be more proud to be associated with each and every one of them. You all may recall that early in the COVID outbreak, the New York metropolitan area was overwhelmed. It quickly became the original COVID hotspot. Hospitals in the city were besieged with patients and outbreaks became all too common in surrounding areas. Our hospital in Greenwich, Connecticut, which sits directly on the New York border, was suddenly impacted with hundreds of patients diagnosed with COVID at one point filling more than half the beds of this small community hospital. The impact of COVID challenges us to this day. At its peak, our health system cared on a single day for nearly 800 COVID positive inpatients, 450 of them right here in New Haven. Unfortunately, since the beginning of this pandemic, more than 4,500 people have lost their battle with COVID across Connecticut. As the largest health system in the state, we experienced nearly 600 of those 4,500 deaths. However, we have now de discharged nearly 4,000 people back to home, healthy and better able to get back to their lives after being hospitalized with COVID. So there is room for optimism. And while we are in the midst of a new uptick, the numbers we see today, 65 patients across our health system and 30 of those here in New Haven, as you heard a minute ago, those numbers pale in comparison with our peak numbers last spring. The challenges have been real and significant from a financial perspective. Our health system will lose nearly half a billion dollars this year due to the costs of battling this virus and the loss of significant volume. I'm proud to say that throughout this, we didn't lay off or furlough any of our employees, and we recognized our employees' sacrifice with a COVID recognition bonus late, late last spring. With the assistance of some federal stimulus funds, our loss will shrink, we hope, to about $130 million. 
But 2020 will mark the first time in nearly half a century that Yelna Haven Hospital and the Yelna Haven Health System will lose money. Our colleague uh, health systems across the nation are no different. If you uh, talk to Mass General Brigham in Boston or New York Presbyterian, their losses are staggering as well. But throughout it all, we made a commitment to our employees and we've stayed true to our values. While we have slowed down some of our investments, we continue to work our way back financially because it is our margin that drives our mission and our mission drives our value. I believe that we are gonna emerge from this pandemic stronger. Today, our health system is one of the international sites for the clinical trials for the new Pfizer vaccine. And I firmly believe, as the governor suggested, that we are closing in on an answer more rapidly than I could have imagined. In the meantime, we continue our vigilance. To date, we have tested more than a quarter of a million people in this state, and we have dispatched mobile vans to communities to meet the needs of our most vulnerable populations. As we look back on this year, we realize that these moments call on all of us to be better. They remind us of our humanity and they show the world what courage and fortitude can accomplish. I cannot begin to imagine a more challenging year than this past one, but as you have shown, as stubborn as this virus can be, the greater New Haven business community is stronger and more resilient. With that, Garrett, let me turn it back to you. Garrett is frozen, I think, or at least he is on my screen. I'm, I'm back. You know, it was, you said it was flawless. That was what uh, the, well, the problem was. Sorry, I jinxed you. Um, so I will uh, adjust my video. There we go. I think I'm back. Um, apologize about that. So my question for you was, uh, as we head into the fall and winter, uh, we have seen uh, that there's been an uptick, some small uptick so far, but how is the hospital planning uh, for what could happen in the fall and winter? And what are some of your expectations? Well, you know, we, we've learned a lot about COVID uh, in the time uh, that uh, since uh, late February when we really began to hunker down, you know, and if you think uh, back to it, um, there was a time at the beginning of March when we said people don't need to wear masks unless they have symptoms. Um, you know, we were worried much more about the spread of the virus based on um, uh, surfaces touched than understanding it was airborne. We didn't know as well how to treat uh, patients who were uh, ill with COVID and all of that has evolved. So, you know, I think that, that what we're uh, seeing right now is an uptick, but we can care for those patients better Better. We'd like to care for more of them at home by doing remote uh, care because a lot of care can be managed safely at home. Uh, we hope that we never get back to the situation of having to close down all elective um, procedures. Um, what we found was when people did start coming back in who didn't have COVID but had other issues, the case mix, the measure of severity was higher than it had been normally because people put off uh, needed care too long. So our plans are we've got um, uh, COVID specific areas in uh, Yale New Haven Hospital that have been designated their negative pressure rooms so that we can provide uh, the safest care possible to the patients and protect our staff during this. Uh, and also cohort those patients so that hopefully we can continue as normal operations as possible. And, and Marna, uh, just in closing, uh, you talked about the entire region. Uh, Yale New Haven Health is such a, a critical anchor uh, to the region. What's your outlook for business in general and how this region uh, can grow once we get through COVID? You know, I, I think I'm, I'm a lot like uh, others who have spoken, and particularly the governor. Um, I, th I think we uh, can and we will come back. Um, New Haven uh, has long been the envy of many people, not just in the state, but in the Northeast for um, uh, its minimal uh, uh, residential vacancy rates, for its ability to attract 
uh, some technology and biotech companies with the presence of uh, not only Yale University, but other universities around us uh, and the work that we're doing at Yale New Haven Health. Um, as a member of the Promise New Haven Board, uh, we're seeing some really promising numbers, no pun intended, in terms of the graduation rate and students going to college. Um, and I think what we have to do is we have to continue uh, to invest uh, in our communities. People need to have access to good education. Uh, they need uh, safe housing. Uh, they need good health care. We need to work on uh, better access uh, to healthier food. Uh, but I think this is a great community to live in. Um, it's uh, much more um, uh, affordable uh, than the uh, major cities to our north and our south. And there's a tremendous um, uh, intellectual reservoir uh, here to draw from. So, you know, I think we have to uh, get through this, but we have to be focused on growth. Thank you so much, Marno. We appreciate it. I know I speak for the entire business community when I say thank you for everything that you and your team have done over the last several months and unfortunately uh, for the months ahead. We, we truly do appreciate it. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you. Well, it's now time to start the awards portion of today's program. Our presenting sponsor of the awards program is Southern Connecticut State University. To kick things off, allow me to welcome President Joe Bertolino. Joe? Thank you, Garrett. And I am pleased to be sitting here with uh, Otis the Owl, uh, our mascot here at Southern Connecticut State University on behalf of Otis, who is donning his COVID mask. Uh, the Southern Connecticut State University community is proud to be the presenting sponsor for this combined annual meeting and awards event. And congratulations to the Greater New Haven Chamber for your steadfast role in our regional business community for the past 226 years. Special kudos to today's awardees in this year of unprecedented challenge. Back in April, when I addressed the graduates of the Chamber's Leadership Center, I said how proud I was of the 12,000 students, faculty, and staff of Southern for their versatility and their nimble thinking as we pivoted to fully remote learning, teaching, and working in such a short space of time. And then turned again to reopen campus in September. I'm sure all of you could share similar stories. And while this pandemic has tested us, in many ways, it's also brought out the best in us. More than ever, we have had to draw on the essentials of detailed planning, clear communication, effective teamwork, and adapt them to ever-changing circumstances. There have been many lessons learned along the way, and will certainly emerge from this crisis with new insights and new skills. Certainly at Southern, even as we manage the fallout of COVID itself, we are already engaged in planning for a new future, both short and long-term. Much of our strategic planning pre-COVID is now in the past, and we must repurpose our thinking and our institution in the face of new realities. Addressing the financial and enrollment implications are two issues we share with all of our peers in higher education. But we also look at other aspects. What new academic programming opportunities are emerging? What will be the workforce needs of a post-COVID era? And perhaps most importantly, and you've heard this earlier today, given our institutional commitment to social justice, how do we address racial inequities and systematic racism laid bare by the pandemic. As a public university that annually sees 85% of its graduates stay on to live and work in Connecticut, Southern has contributed a great deal to our great state. How our contribution is defined from here on out will depend a great deal on what we've learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. Southern looks forward to our continued collaboration with the Chamber and the many organizations and businesses that partner with us for the betterment of our community. So on behalf of our students, all of us here at Southern, I wish all of you continued health and safety for yourself and those you love. Garrett, I'm gonna hand it back to you 
to start the award ceremony. Thank you. Joe, thank you so much. And uh, we truly do appreciate the partnership with Southern. I want to thank you and I'll th also thank all of our other award sponsors uh, that we will see in just a few moments, AT&T, Carmody, Torrance, Sandeck and Hennessy, Comcast Business, UI, Regional Water Authority, Community Foundation for Greater New Haven, University Properties and AMS. Now, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Eric Scaranuzzo. Uh, Eric is with Merrill Lynch and Bank of America. And we've been every year doing our Heritage Award that we celebrate for an organization that's been in existence for 100 years. And we'll turn it over to Eric to introduce our award winner for this year. Thank you. I am the resident director of the Merrill Lynch office here in New Haven. Bank of America and our Maryland's division have been longstanding partners with the Greater New Haven Chamber of Commerce, local businesses, and our local community. Over the years, we have been dedicated to connecting our people, resources, capabilities, and our capital to help local businesses achieve their goals and drive economic growth and prosperity to fuel our region. We are committed to empowering, enhancing the financial success and resilience of local residents to help our communities thrive. 2020 has and continues to be an extraordinary year. At Bank of America, we believe that now more than ever, it is critical, it is critical for business stakeholders to demonstrate leadership and step up. Since early this year, my teammates across our company have come together to help each other, our clients and our communities through a health and humanitarian crisis. Early on in the pandemic, Bank of America made a $100 million supplemental community commitment to COVID relief for nonprofits addressing pressing needs in our local communities. We became the first bank to accept payroll protection program small business loan applications. In early April, reported by the SBA to be the largest PPP provider in the U.S. by number of approved loans supporting more than 345,000 small businesses in every industry. And over the summer, Bank of America made a $1 billion four-year commitment to help local communities address economic and racial inequality accelerated by the global pandemic. We know there is much to be done to bolster local businesses, nonprofits, and institutions, and our commitment is unwavering. For the past decade, my colleagues at Bank of America and the Merrill Lynch Division have been proud to support the Chamber's annual Heritage Award and are honored to continue that legacy of recognizing outstanding institutions that have served as the cornerstone of our greater New Haven community for more than 100 years. This year's recipient of the Heritage Award is the University of New Haven. Founded in 1920, the University of New Haven is celebrating its centennial this year. The university has a rich history of being an active member of the greater New Haven community. Its innovative and market-driven programs are preparing students to be the leaders in the careers of the future, here in New Haven, across Connecticut, and around the globe. It's now my pleasure to introduce University of New Haven President Dr. Stephen Kaplan to accept the Heritage Award. Thank you. Now we'll introduce Dr. Kaplan. Sarah Sheehan and all of the members of the Greater New Haven Chamber of Commerce for honoring the University of New Haven in this important way. And I want to thank all of you for what you do for the surrounding community and its economy. The university has been serving the economic needs of the region since its founding on the Yale campus in 1920. We've literally graduated tens of thousands of local residents and helped them find rewarding employment with some of the leading companies in the region, including many of yours. I don't think there's a story that better illustrates the role the university has played in the local economy than when Hank Bartels, one of our most significant benefactors, was asked about 60 years ago by Herb Pierce, who I'm sure all of you know at least by name, to join the Board of Governors of the University of New Haven. 
Hank said, I'm a Cornell graduate. I know nothing about the university. And Herb said, go and ask your employees at American Silver, Hank was the CEO there, how many of them are graduates of the university and then come back and talk to me. And what Hank found was that almost all of his engineers and many of the business office employees were in fact graduates of the university, which is common again for many of the companies across the region. So Hank joined our board and the rest is history. He and his family have been incredible supporters of the university and they've watched the many students they've supported at the university go on to become leaders and in many cases CEOs of area businesses with great pride. So I thank you again for this honor. I know that we've served you well over the last hundred years. As we move into the next hundred years and focus on areas like cybersecurity, the health sciences, biomedical engineering, we're on the cutting edge of what you're looking for and what the market is looking for in employees. And we look forward to continuing to serve you in the many ways that help your company succeed. Thanks again for this great honor. Take care, be safe. And thank you, President Kaplan. We appreciate the partnership that we have with the University of New Haven. Um, let me now introduce John Emra. He is the president of AT&T Connecticut and will introduce our Legislative Leadership Award. John. Hello friends and fellow chamber members. My name is John Emra with AT&T. AT&T is so pleased to sponsor this year's Legislative Leadership Award. More so, I am honored to be able to present the award to this year's recipient, Tony Harp. Now, I think Tony is somebody who needs not a lot of introduction to any of us. Um, she is someone throughout her career, including her time on the Board of Alders, her 20 years in the State Senate, and three terms as mayor, was a strong and effective and tireless advocate for the people for whom she represented. I think one of her really greatest accomplishments is the creation of a health insurance program that helped to cover thousands and thousands of Connecticut children who otherwise would not have health insurance but for her outstanding work. Now, in a career that spans some 30 years, um, a public service career, I should say, that spans some 30 years, there's lots of different um, descriptions of her work. But I think one of the things that is probably most noteworthy, frankly, is the, um, the recognition that was bestowed upon her by her colleagues in the State Senate as being the conscience of the State Senate. I think that recognition, perhaps more than anything else, speaks volumes about Tony's commitment to the cause of social justice. So Tony, congratulations. Um, thank you so much for your years of work um, in public service to the people of New Haven. Um, I am so honored to give you this award and perhaps more so to call you a friend. Thank you very much. Um, and I, I, I'm honored to be called a friend of yours too. We've worked together for many, many years. Um, I want to first congratulate the, all of the awardees, the new board and officers of the Greater New Haven Chamber of Commerce. And I want to thank you for this recognition. I am honored and distinguished by this, re this recognition and this award. But I've got to say to you that no one in politics does anything alone. First, I'd like to thank my family. I started out in politics when my youngest child was six years old. He now owns his own business and uh, has a child of his own. So they have been with me for, for many, many years. I want to thank the residents of the second ward in New Haven because that's where I was first elected. And I want to thank the residents of the 10th Senatorial District, those residents who live both in the western side of New Haven and in West Haven. I especially want to thank Don Williams, who was president of the Senate, president pro tem of the Senate, and worked really hard to assure that I become Senate Chair of Appropriations. And I held that spot for 11 years, and it really gave me the ability to do some things on behalf of New Haven and the state that were important to do. So the people of New Haven as well elected me their mayor, as you heard for three terms, the only woman in 382 years to serve as mayor. I am proud of the work that all of us have done together, listening to our business community, as well as to those who live in our communities, trying to help everyone do, have a better life. 
I want to congratulate the Greater New Haven Chamber of Commerce with over 226 years. You have supported the business community and you have supported Greater New Haven in good times and bad. And I'm certain that you will prevail through this pandemic. I'm very heartened that you have are working towards social justice and racial justice. And I look forward to your success. Thank you so much again for this honor. And thank you, Mayor. We, we appreciate it. We appreciate all the support that you always gave the business community. I'll never forget uh, you showing up at our expo in the middle of a snowstorm. So uh, thank you so much. Now I want to welcome Greg Burton, partner at Carmody Torrance, Sandak, and Hennessy to present our next award. Good afternoon. My name is Greg Burton, and I'm a partner at Carmody, Torrance, Sandak, and Hennessy. Carmody is a full-service law firm serving businesses and individuals from our primary offices in Waterbury, New Haven, and Stamford, our office in the Upward Hartford Business Incubator, and our convenience offices in Southport and Litchfield. One of Carmody's core values is service to the communities in which we live and work. We do this through a range of coordinated volunteer events, financial support of nonprofit organizations, pro bono work on behalf of charitable organizations and individuals, and by encouraging and rewarding commitments of our attorneys to service on boards and commissions and other individual volunteer service activities. We believe that our commitment to service improves our communities in ways that create new opportunities for us and others creating a positive feedback loop of continual growth and betterment. Understanding the importance of volunteer service, we are grateful for the opportunity today to introduce the Greater New Haven Chamber of Commerce Volunteer of the Year. This year's honoree for Volunteer of the Year is Mary Ellen Cody, the Dean of Development and Community Partnerships at Gateway Community College. Her efforts on behalf of the Chamber include representing Gateway on the Chamber's board and serving on its Leadership Program Advisory Council. Listen to these words from board members who know her. Quote, Mary Ellen constantly amazes me with her ability to recognize issues and barriers to success and then creatively turning those negatives into opportunities that positively impact and enrich the lives of so many individuals and families, says Helene Augustine. Quote, Mary Ellen's drive and passion is unmatched and legendary. I've had the privilege of having a front row seat in witnessing the fruits of her tenacity and dedication, says fellow board member Tom Bairn. In addition to her role as board member, Mary Ellen was appointed chair of the Chamber's 225th Anniversary Committee, helping to organize year-long programming that included business focus groups to support the Chamber's strategic planning effort. She also helped to coordinate the grant selection process for the Wells Fargo Foundation's Small Business Grant Program, which assisted businesses in Greater New Haven, most impacted by COVID-19. Mary Ellen, the Chamber is so grateful for your commitment and service to your community. Please accept this very special award. Congratulations, Thank you, Greg. Greg. Thank you, Garrett. Appreciate it. Um, really, you all are so wonderful. I want to thank Greg and Tom at Carmody um, for your kind introduction and for your support, your strong support of the chamber and the business community. I'm humbled to be selected for this type of an award that means so much to me and to be part of such a distinguished group of honorees. I congratulate all of them today. As Garrett knows, I like to say, this is not our father's chamber. 226 years since its inception, the chamber is stronger and more reflective of this community. With Jeff's strategic vision, Garrett's leadership, and the hard charging work of Tamika, Betsy, Anne, and all of the talented chamber staff, our chamber is more diverse and highly committed 
to supporting the needs of businesses, large and small, in this region. And it needs to be. With over a million people out of work in Connecticut, our region needs this incredible board, the committee members, volunteers, and our community to be involved, to make a difference, to come together to make an impact. I've been fortunate to have key mentors in my life and at Gateway specifically to be supported by extraordinary leaders, Dr. Kendrick, Dr. Brody, and now Dr. Coley and Dr. Brown, guiding our college and our region to do the best we can to serve our students. We continue to develop our strong workforce partnerships, and this allows all of us at the college to invest our time in organizations that provide value and opportunities for our students. Dr. Coley and Dr. Brown are on the RLC. Sheila Salerno participates in the Healthcare Council. Erica Lynch is on the Economic Development Council, and many others at our college serve as needed on the chamber committees. I need to thank my Gateway colleagues, particularly the Workforce Development and Marketing teams for supporting my work with the chamber, and of course, the amazing board members of the Gateway Community College Foundation Board. And finally, I send a loving thank you to my husband, Tom, and our boys, Pat and Kevin, for understanding my passion for this work. Thank you, Garrett. Thank you, Jeff, and everyone. Mary Ellen, thank you. Uh, we really appreciate all the time that you devote into the chamber. Now, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce Paul Savas. Paul is Vice President for Western New England Region for Comcast Business, and he's here to present our next award. Paul. On behalf of the 1,250 Connecticut-based Comcast, Comcast Business, and Xfinity employees, we are once again extremely proud to partner with the Greater New Haven Chamber of Commerce in the 226th annual meeting. You know, the last seven months have been absolutely unprecedented and amazing in the resiliency that we've seen, not only in the business community, but also in our employees and I'm sure you feel the same way about your employees. To have been able to provide the connectivity solutions to help keep businesses up and running has been an extreme privilege and honor. Whether it's a healthcare institution, a medium-sized business, or a small business in the food service sector implementing curbside ordering and pickup, we've been a part of that. Whether it's a large organization that's had to augment their network connectivity to allow for tens hundreds and thousands of employees to work from home, we've been a part of that as well. It's been a privilege to serve this entire membership. Thank you. The 2020 Technology Innovation Award goes to the Yale School of Public Health. The public health challenges this year brought to light the critical importance of integrating interdisciplinary scientific expertise with community partnerships. Specific to the COVID-19 pandemic response, Yale scientists have repeatedly innovated and adapted their expertise to invent saliva direct so that it can be accessible to all, modify a wristband environmental contaminant detection technology to also find virus particles, and to discover a metabolic pathway that explains why COVID-19 is worse in men than in women, lead New Haven contact tracing to slow viral spread and model projections of transmission paths and rates to help guide healthcare reopening and vaccine policies at the international, national, state, and local levels. Further, students, faculty, staff, and alumni alike have supported the well being of their neighbors through boots on the ground volunteerism across the New Haven region for schools, arts organizations, homeless, vulnerable elderly, and many more. Now I would like to introduce Sten Verman, Anna M. R. Lauder, Melinda Irwin, Rafael Perez Escamilla, who will be accepting the award for the Yale School of Public Health. Thank you. Go ahead, Stan. Paul Garrett and the Greater New Haven Chamber of Commerce community, thank you for selecting the Yale School of Public Health for this prestigious 
Technology and Innovation Award. I'm proud to serve as Dean here at the school. Our community has tackled COVID-19 pandemic with novel and innovative scientific discovery. And then we are translating research into action and policy advocacy. We're also proud of our boots on the ground volunteerism across greater New Haven, trying to shatter that stereotype of the Yale Ivory Tower uh, and working with partners like SCSU and our community-based friends, to name a few. Speaking personally, my colleagues, Crystal Pollitt, Marie Bro, Dan Dan Lee, Elizabeth Lynn and I have put a lot of energy into helping our schools and arts organizations to ensure proper safety practices and building air, and building air handling to ensure successful educational and cultural pursuits. Um, as Dean, I'd like to speak on behalf of nearly 900 faculty, staff, and student members of the Yale School of Public Health. We are honored to be your neighbors and are committed to New Haven's West being, well-being. Our, that was well-being, not West being. <laughs> I invite Dr. Melinda Irwin, our Associate Dean of Research, to comment further. Thank you for inviting me to represent the scientific community of the Yale School of Public Health. In March, approximately 50% of our scientists pivoted their research to focus on the pandemic response. A mere sampling of the response includes doctors Nate Grubaugh and Wiley and their team developed Saliva Direct to test for COVID-19. They received FDA emergency use approval to further test and make Saliva Direct accessible to all. Dr. Linda Nikolai, James Meek, and their team at the Yale School of Public Health CDC Emerging Infections Program developed and implemented a contact tracing program that is now a state model. The school's public health modeling groups analyze data to project transmission paths and guide healthcare, reopening, and vaccine policies. And Dr. Albert Coe is co-chairing the Reopen Connecticut Advisory Group. We are so proud of the work done at Yale School of Public Health. I'm pleased to now share the stage with Dr. Rafael Perez Escamela, Director of the Office of Public Health Practice at the Yale School of Public Health. Thank you very much, uh, Melinda. So honored to accept this very high recognition on behalf of the team at the Yale School of Public Health's Office of Public Health Practice and all our YSPH members who have dedicated many efforts towards the safety and well being of the people of New Haven. Additional support was provided by our office and the school to communities of color, the elderly, homeless, and opioid users through food and prescription delivery programs, education, and awareness materials and campaigns. These efforts would not have been possible without our strong partnership with the United Way of Greater New Haven. Currently, OPHP, as we fondly know our office, is working side by side with the New Haven Health Department, strongly supporting the effort to assess the potential to introduce the saliva direct test into New Haven public schools so that they can be reopened safely. Thank you very much again for this amazing recognition. Great, thank you so much. Uh, it's incredible uh, the work that's going on here in New Haven and I know uh, we are all so thankful. Uh, we're now at the, uh, a little bit more than the midway point of our awards and I encourage everyone to stick around with us because we have a lot uh, more to go through, but we're gonna get it in uh, to, we should be wrapping up right around five o'clock. So stay with us, we have a couple more, uh, many more important things that we wanna cover, but I wanna introduce right now, Manny Mirzoi an Iranian American composer with the Neighborhood Music School. And he's going to play for us uh, a quick song that he put together, uh, particularly for this event, Manny. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to my little studio. Uh, hope you can uh, enjoy the next uh, minute and a half with me. <laughs>
Thank you, Manning. We appreciate it. Uh, beautiful sound. And um, I think got everyone back for ready for our next round of awards. I'm pleased to introduce Ryan Wolf from United Illuminating to address, introduce our Developer Investment Award. Ryan. Good afternoon, and thank you for having me. My name is Ryan Wolf. I work for Avant Grid in our Economic and Community Development Department, and I'm a proud board member of the Greater New Haven Chamber of Commerce. Avant Grid is a parent company of United Illuminating and Southern Connecticut Gas, which serves the Greater New Haven and Bridgeport region. Avant Grid's headquarters is located in Orange, Connecticut, and has over 1,500 employees located in the state. As a proud supporter of the Chamber and Economic Development Initiatives throughout our region, I am pleased to present the Developer Investment Award to the Glendower Group, a nonprofit 501c3 corporation established in 2001 as an instrumentality to the Elm City Communities Housing Authority in New Haven. Glendower is at the forefront of those leading the private sector market in affordable housing who provides comprehensive and integrated real estate development services. Together, Glendower and ECC and HANH have undertaken an aggressive redevelopment modernization programming, allowing for the transformation of its housing portfolio throughout the city of New Haven. In 2009, Glendower served as a sole developer or co-developer of over 15 major affordable and market rate developments. I welcome Karen Dubois Walton, president of the Glendower Group, to accept this award. Karen, uh, why don't you uh, go ahead? I do, we had some prepared remarks, but we've got you here live, so we'll, we'll have you talk. Okay, all right, great. Thank you so much. Um, it is such an honor. Did I let the video play? <laughs> Working team we'll take you live. We'll, we'll... We're doing such great work to transform the chamber in new and exciting ways. So thank you uh, so Glendower much. It's such an honor to be recognized by the Greater New Haven Chamber of Commerce. Uh, thank you to Garrett. Uh, thank you to the board, um, the hardworking team at the chamber who's doing so much for us. Um, this is really an honor to be recognized for work that we've been doing in this community since 2001. I really want to thank the team at the Glendower Group that's led by Ms. Sinead Drawn, our Senior Vice President, for the commitment that she and her team have made in transforming this community. The impact of their work is notable from the Hill to downtown, from West Rock to Fairhaven, from Worcester Square to Dixwell and New Hallville. You can see the visible impact of the investments that have been made as we're transforming communities in ways that are providing quality housing in environmentally sound ways and cost effectively. Our investment of over $800 million in the 2,500 units that have been built has generated economic activity in this community, including over 40% of those dollars going to small minority owned businesses, women owned businesses, and section three businesses in this community. We're so proud of the way that the Glendower Group is empowering responsible development. It's an honor to be recognized today with the, my fellow honorees um, and uh, organizations and individuals that are making such an important contribution in this community and let's together keep moving New Haven forward. Thank you so much. Karen, thank you so much. We, we appreciate you being on with us and uh, these projects that you're doing are just transforming New Haven. So congratulations. Thank you. It's now my pleasure to introduce Ted Norris, the Vice President of Asset Management from the Regional Water Authority to present our next award. Each year, RWA is the presenting sponsor for our Leadership Center. Ted? Hello, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Ted Norris. I'm the Vice President of Asset Management at the Regional Water Authority, or RWA for short. From our offices in New Haven, we oversee the protection of over 20, 27,000 acres of watershed land and the delivery of over 43 million gallons of high quality water a day to nearly 430,000 customers. The RWA has been a member of the Greater New Haven community for over 170 years, and we are committed to collaborating with organizations like the Greater New Haven Chamber of Commerce to make this region an even better place to live and work. That is why we have for many years supported Leadership Greater New Haven, a program that equips professionals from a wide range of backgrounds with the skills they need to succeed and to do good in the community. 
Hundreds of people have graduated from the Chamber's leadership program and gone on to do great things. Today is my honor to introduce a particularly distinguished graduate of the leadership program. I am pleased to announce that the alumnus of the Leadership Center Award is being presented to Jill Cretella. Since 1999, Jill has worked at Marrakesh Incorporated, where she is currently the Chief Administrative Officer, responsible for overseeing the human resources, staff training, risk management, information technology, development, and fundraising functions for the organization. She also served for more than 10 years as an Employment and Community Service Program Surveyor for CARF International, an accredited body for human resource organizations across the United States and Canada. Jill has served on a number of community-based committees, boards, and advisory councils over the years and enjoys any opportunity to collaborate with others to bring about real and positive change. I would like now to introduce Jill Cotella, our distinguished alumnus of the Leadership Center. Thank you, and I want to thank the Chamber for selecting me for this award. When I started the Leadership Greater New Haven program back in 2001, I was not really sure what to expect, having not known anyone else who had gone through it. A colleague of mine from another organization suggested I apply and attend with her, and so I did. At the time, it was a 10-month program with full-day workshops and a fairly significant community service project requirement, so I crossed my fingers and hoped it would be worth it in the end, and of course it was. While I enjoyed the workshops, guest speakers, tours of parts of New Haven that I thought I already knew but really didn't, the best part of attending the program was the connection I made with the other professionals, many of which I still have today, 18 years later. To me, that is invaluable and taught me early on in my career that it is really hard to create change in isolation and that working with a team, learning to collaborate will always be what moves us forward. I think that one of the most important jobs of a good leader is developing the skills of future leaders or helping to strengthen the skills of current ones. I was the first employee from Marrakesh to attend the leadership program at the chamber and we have sent other employees most years ever since. I'm appreciative that Marrakesh recognized in me someone worth supporting, especially so early on in my career. And I look forward to continuing to extend that support to others. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. We appreciate it. Congratulations. Uh, we are extremely excited about this year's leadership program. It'll be getting underway in just another week, next week to be exact. You can still sign up. One of the features of this year's program is a series of immersive diversity, equity, and inclusion sessions. Now this year, as we've discussed, we've experienced significant changes. It has been a year to look at ourselves and renew our commitment to change. And today we are pleased to present a new recognition for organizations that are doing just that. Let me now introduce Will Ginsberg, President and CEO of the Community Foundation for Greater New Haven. Will. Thank you, Garrett. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to be uh, with the Chamber uh, and with uh, so many of my friends. Uh, special uh, thanks and congratulations to, uh, to Jeff Klaus and Howard Hill for your leadership of the Chamber and of course to Garrett. And the, found, the Community Foundation is uh, delighted to sponsor this new uh, Chamber Award for equity, for equity and Inclusive Opportunity. Um, I want to thank uh, uh, Tamika Miller uh, from the Chamber staff and, and Arthur Thomas from the Community Foundation staff for their work on this. Um, we're delighted because the Foundation's new strategic plan, which we adopted last year, is entitled Opportunity and Equity. Why that title? The foundation believes that in our that believes in our community and and the people of this community and we, and we believe that we can only make progress as a community if we all move forward together. We believe that our community will only move forward on the issues that we work on at the foundation, issues of health and education and early childhood and arts and basic needs and so many others if we are growing as a community and creating opportunity for our people. And if we're creating opportunity, especially for people and families that have historically been marginalized and left out of the progress of our community. And that's what opportunity and equity means. And we believe too, that to do that, we all need to change the way we think and to change the way we do things. We need to bring the business sector and the social sector together, perhaps more than we have in the past. And this new award uh, is emblematic of doing exactly that. And as you've been hearing all afternoon, these times demand this more than ever. Even before COVID, 
struck. Uh, this, we, this, we, we have been living in a time of inequality and widening inequality. And COVID-19 has not only had a devastating impact on our economy and our businesses, but the racial disparities of COVID-19, uh, the, the way we've seen racial disparities in health and education and the, shed, and the shredding of our safety net uh, all make uh, not only uh, investing in opportunity, but investing in equity that much more important. The foundation is going to be taking unprecedented, unprecedented steps to do that, uh, which I'll have more to say about later. So 2020 and beyond and looking forward, this is the time for our community to come together to create greater opportunity and to, great, to create greater equity and to focus on opportunity and equity as our highest priorities. So it's with great pride uh, to, uh, that, that I have the opportunity today to recognize two companies that embody this commitment uh, in our community through what they do every day as the first honorees of the Chamber's uh, Equity and Inclusive Opportunity Award. Uh, so the first honoree is Marrakesh. Marrakesh is a diverse nonprofit organization that has been providing person-centered human services for children and adults with and without disabilities in Connecticut for almost 50 years. Inclusion and equity is at the core of everything Marrakesh does as it seeks to increase social justice through its many programs. Marrakesh's intentional work to create growth and opportunity is apparent in the organization's practices, including the hiring and, and internal promotion of its employees. And it's evident in its services, such as its Academy for Human Service Training, and evident in its policies as demonstrated by the inclusion of strategic planning goals centered on succession, succession and leadership development, and action steps on accessibility and risk management plans that require advocacy at the state level to improve employee wages. And I'm happy to say and proud to say that the Community Foundation is a longtime supporter of Marrakesh. And our second honoree is Jean Christensen, Christensen Associates. Uh, the mission of Jean Christensen Associates is to empower small underserved businesses by connecting them to opportunities with large corporations and government agencies. The firm provides training, coaching, and advocacy for underserved in terms of outcomes that reduce the wealth gap for underserved small businesses. Jean Christensen Associates team has been instrumental in connecting underserved businesses to over 70, that's 70, 70 million dollars in government contracts. Jean and her team also practice what they preach in that they outsource goods and services to other minority and women-owned business enterprises. JKA is a very small business that serves a very large audience and a very important cause. And each month the firm puts on various workshops and trainings aimed at increasing opportunities for local small minority and women owned businesses. So it is with great pride that I recognize Heather Latora, the president and CEO of Marrakesh and Jean Christensen, the president and CEO of Jean Christensen Associates who will accept these awards from the chamber. Thank you. Thank you so much, Will. It is an exceptional honor for me to accept this award in the distinguished company of our other award recipients on behalf of Marrakesh, the people we support, our employees, and our volunteer board of directors. In a world of having so much less control of things than desired, I take solace in that in this space, in New Haven, in this community, in this organization and with my outstanding colleagues, there is a shared, relentless commitment to equity and inclusion. Our Marrakesh Multicultural Advisory Council, with its longest standing member leader, Mark Chartier, has been persistent for decades in addressing equity and inclusion, not only at Marrakesh, but statewide. We have steadily been creating opportunity after opportunity. We identify and remove barriers, assess where we are, and then repeat. This award made us examine our statistics, which I have to say are pretty impressive. However, we're the most proud of each individual's story of overcoming oppression and achieving personal success once presented with opportunity. This recognition means the world to all of us at Marrakesh as we continue on our journey in creating opportunity, promoting inclusion, and reducing inequities across our community. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Heather. And let me bring in Jean now. Jean? Thank you, Garrett. Um, thank you to Garrett. Thank you to the Chamber of Commerce for your leadership, to the board, and special thanks to my colleagues in the Diversity and Inclusion Committee committee for their tireless efforts toward this mission. All my life, I have been part of the other group, which includes um, racial disparities, gender disparities. Um, my earliest memories um, include being told that, you know, I could not do certain things when I thought about even going, you know, what, what I was going to be when I grow up. Um, you know, I was advised to be a secretary or an office worker. I watch my parents struggle. Both my parents are immigrants. I watch them struggle for basic necessities, like a decent neighborhood for us to grow up in, um, access to good quality food, access to quality education. This, this struggle took a toll on my parents and our family, oftentimes my parents working multiple jobs just to make ends meet. It was not until we found success through entrepreneurship that that changed for us. By gaining access to opportunities, um, to work with government agencies and large corporations through supplier diversity programs and other programs designed to help underserved um, small and local businesses were, did, did our lives change. And by, by life changing, I mean things like having access to the basic necessities. It wasn't about getting rich. Entrepreneurship and access to government contracts, the corporate supply chain is one of the most valuable tools that underserved communities have to help close the wealth gap. This is particularly important during this pandemic, which shined a light on the impact that disparities um, have on underserved communities um, in terms of healthcare, access to capital, and um, contracts. As the president of Gene Christensen Associates, a big part of what I do is connecting corporations um, to connecting corporations and um, people to be more inclusive, remove barriers to success, so that everyone has an opportunity to do well and to be well. It is my great honor to be part of the Diversity and Inclusion um, uh, uh, Council with the Chamber of Commerce, and I wanna thank you very much for this award. Jean, thank you so much, and uh, you're so deserving. We appreciate everything that you do on the Diversity and Inclusion Council and your leadership there. Uh, let me now recognize a business who has been a part of our community for many years, and like many small businesses, has found ways and to not only operate, but actually expand during this pandemic. Um, to introduce this award, I welcome in Lauren Zucker with Yale University, who is representing University Properties to share more about our next honoree. Lauren? Thank you, Garrett. Um, I'm honored on behalf of Yale University to be giving out this year's Small Business Achievement Award to Claire's Cornucopia. Through Yale's Community Investment Program, we are proud to support Claire's and other local New Haven businesses, creating jobs, reinvigorating New Haven's downtown, and expanding the city's tax base. You heard earlier about our School of Public Health and the incredible work that they are doing during this pandemic. Additionally, through our Yale Community for New Haven Fund, Yale has directly donated over $2 million since March 2020 to local nonprofits to support New Haven residents negatively impacted by the pandemic, including funding Chromebooks for New Haven public school students, supporting learning hubs, purchasing PPE, and providing funding for restaurants to deliver meals to frontline workers and others. We are equally focused on supporting our merchants during these difficult times. And today we are delighted to celebrate with one of them. Claire's Cornucopia is an iconic, organic and sustainable vegetarian restaurant located on Chapel Street at the Shops at Yale. They specialize in homemade vegetarian, vegan and gluten-free foods while using sustainable practices. Owned by its namesake, Claire Criscola, nothing keeps Claire down, not even a global pandemic. Having made the decision to renovate the restaurant pre-COVID, Claire and her team pursued the remodel beginning in March and recently reopened in August with a fabulous expanded space. Please come and visit. And while you are there, please support all of your local small businesses, especially during these challenging times. Since inception, Claire has maintained a constant focus on serving the New Haven community and supporting important programs, 
such as New Haven Reads, Clifford Beard's Child Guidance Clinic, Yale New Haven Hospital's Neonatal Intensive Care Unit, and Camp Kesem at Yale, just to name a few. Good things are meant to last, and that is why Claire's Cornucopia just celebrated its 45th anniversary in New Haven. Claire treats her customers and staff like family. She has a wonderful heart, which is why I consider myself lucky to have her both as a long-standing tenant as well as a friend. Now I'd like to introduce Claire Criscola, owner of Claire's Cornucopia. Uh-oh. Go ahead, Claire, we can see you. Ah, I'm trying. Okay, there I go. Hi, thank you so much. This is, Lauren, thank you. Thank you so much. This is a, a privilege. It is a privilege to be in the company of all the award recipients. I appreciate all of you and what you do in this beautiful community of ours. When this pandemic first struck, we were devastated like everyone else. Um, truth be told, the first thing I did though was stock, start stockpiling alcohol and bleach. But right after that, I realized that this was gonna be serious. When we first shut down, we actually thought it was gonna be two weeks. We all planned on coming back in a couple of weeks and the virus would be contained I don't know where we even got that idea from, maybe eternal optimism or just foolishness. But after the second week and we realized this was gonna be a long haul, then I knew right away that I had to start, first of all, letting my staff know that I was gonna to continue to do what I always do, promise to do the right thing and promise to do the very best I can. And then the next thing I did was think about Mr. Rogers and I knew I needed the helpers. And I have to say the chamber, even though I wasn't even a member, reached out to me asking how I was doing. University properties reached out to me, what can we do to help? Former students came in, contacted me and said, what can we do to help? People with tremendous degrees, like from School of Management, asked how they could help us with marketing as we were giving our message throughout the closing while we were doing the renovation, which we had already planned. So we, we really weren't quite sure where we were gonna get money from. And then our legislators started contacting us. It was a true collaboration that kept us going. Customers were sending us notes asking, what can I do to help? Could I buy gift cards? Parents of students were sending us thank you cards. It was just, we had this bubble that we were in that pretty much we did what we needed to do. If we needed money for something, I'd call my brothers. If we needed something done, we would figure out how to do it ourselves and how to hire someone to get something done. But this pandemic really taught me about the importance of really having being part of this greater community. And the chamber is the star of it. The chamber has the connections. They are in it forever, over 200 years, and to help us be successful. And I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful to our bank. I'm so grateful to my staff. I have the best staff. And I'm so honored and privileged to get this recognition because I feel like I'm getting an award for just having the best job in the world because it's a very special place. But Claire's is a very special place because of the people. It's always been about the people. The food is really good, but it's about the people. So thank you so much. And I hope we're there for the people for many, many years to come. And I think we will be because we just invested a lot in place. <laughs> and it's beautiful, Claire. Thank you so thank you. much. Thank you so much. And, and my daughter loved that cupcake uh, that you gave her last week too. So oh, yay. wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. And please support Claire's and all of our other small businesses. Uh, they need our support at this time. Let me now introduce Chris Amaral of AMS Practice Management to present our Achievements in Manufacturing Award. Chris. Good morning or good afternoon. Thank you. I think if there was a uh, an acceptance speech award, Claire might uh, be a strong nominee for it. So thank you, uh, Garrett, and to the whole chamber and team responsible for making number 226 a reality. What an encouragement to see our local businesses rally together to celebrate uncommon successes in an uncommon year. My name is Chris at AMS Practice Management, and we are recruiters committed to our client success. We recruit into a large array of positions across several industries, including manufacturing, financial services, healthcare, and legal. We're not just a vendor, we're a partner. We understand that our client's team is foundational to their success. And so we understand that finding the right candidate is about more than keywords on a resume. 
We go beyond job boards, algorithms, and keyword searches. Our secret sauce is admittedly pretty simple. Thorough, be personal, and equip our customers to be the best at what they do. Good recruiting is about seeking cultural fit, personality, experience, and so much more. With that being said, we're particularly excited to partner with the Chamber in presenting this manufacturing award because manufacturing has been such a bright spot in our economy and state despite a uniquely challenging year. Today, the, proud, the Chamber proudly awards Brook and Whittle Manufacturing based in Guilford with the 2020 Achievements in Manufacturing Award. Brook and Whittle, Brook and Whittle excuse me, is the leading sustainable labeling solution provider in North America. They use innovative technology and complex decoration capabilities ensuring quality packaging that stands out. For over 20 years, Brook and Whittle has provided sensitive shrink sleeve and heat transfer labels for a wide variety of markets, including premium beverage, home care, personal care, food industries, nutraceutical, wine and spirits, and the finest craft beers. Brook and Whittle has expanded their operations in Guilford and North Brantford. And now I would like to introduce Jeremy Letterman, Senior Vice President of Operations and Supply Chain, who will be accepting this award on behalf of Brook and Whittle. Ladies and gentlemen, a digital round of, round of applause for Jer Jeremy Letterman. Thank you, Chris, for your introduction and congrats to the other award recipients as well. Um, Chris, you took a lot, a lot of my words from my mouth, so hopefully I'm not repetitive here, but that was great. Uh, thank you to the Greater New Haven Chamber and everyone who nominated and selected Brook and Whittle for this award. We are honored and grateful for the recognition. Um, who is Brook and Whittle? Well, we're a prime label printer right here in Connecticut, headquartered in Connecticut, originally founded in 1996 back in North Brantford. We have two manufacturing facilities here where it all started, and we now have grown to over eight separate facilities across the United States. The types of products we print are something you probably have in your house today. We print from Smart Water to Gold Peak Iced Tea, various Bath and Body Works products, White Barn Candles, and Tostito Salsa, so Sabra Hummus, Lay's Chips, all of which I probably had way too much of during this pandemic. Um, but also, we've even helped out from the standpoint of printing sanitizer, hand sanitizer labels as well during this pandemic. Our customers not only come to us for the beautifully printed labels that we produce, but they come to us for the leading sustainable labeling solutions we provide. There's a lot of talk today about sustainability, pollution of plastic. However, our labels do not pollute the waste stream. They actually wash away from the polyester bottles or the PET bottles, and they enable the host container to be recycled. So we have solutions that long-term are gonna be sustainable for the environment in the packaging industry. As this demand for sustainable labeling solutions has increased, uh, so has our, our demand for people and equipment in the area. And people, it's been, been very difficult for us. We've added over 50 jobs in the Connecticut area just over just under the last year and a half. And our partnership with Workforce Alliance, the Gateway Community College, and the development of the Manufacturing Pipeline Program has been key in us finding great talent to help grow our business here right in Connecticut. Uh, we look forward to expanding this partnership and continue our growth with all of you in the years to come. On behalf of the entire Brook and Whittle team, thank you again for this recognition. We are humbled and honored. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. And uh, we are coming close to the end here, but I wanna ask everyone to stick around. We have one more important award to do, uh, and then we're going to have that grand prize. So in about 10 minutes, American Green Fuels, our sponsor of the Grand Prize, is going to be helping us draw that, so please stick around. Now, we've come to the time when we would normally recognize our Community Leadership Award. This is the most prestigious award the Chamber gives out each year. There were many qualified candidates this year, but given where we are, that we're virtual, we couldn't be all together, we decided to do something different this year. The Community Leadership Award is relatively new in the Chamber's history when you look at 226 years. Past recipients are listed in your program and throughout the years we know not everyone has been recognized. This year the story of William Lanson, a black business owner in New Haven in the early 1800s, impacted Connecticut's growth. He has received new attention and at the Chamber we want to do our part to shine a light on his story and the lessons it teaches us for how we move forward. The story of William Lanson is a uniquely American story. Born and raised in the early days of the new nation, William Lanson rose to prominence as an entrepreneur, engineer, and civic leader, in spite of the fact that he, a black man, was living in Connecticut, where slavery was still legal. 
Inspired by a community of people who had witnessed and participated in the Revolutionary War, Lanson believed that he also had the right to the American dream. William Lanson was born in 1782 to his mother, Desire, and to his father, Laban Riggs, in Oxford, Connecticut. William was influenced by his relatives and the people from his community. Laban, who also used the surname of Lanson, was a veteran of the Revolutionary War, having served in Connecticut's 6th Regiment. Sometime in the early 1800s, the Lansons were living in New Haven. By 1807, William and his brother Reuben had purchased land, a large open field from Mary Wooster outside of New Haven's original nine squares. The area later became the fancy Wooster Square neighborhood. Four years later in 1811, William Lanson designed, directed, and participated in the construction of the 1500 foot extension to the wharf in the New Haven Harbor. Lanton's construction was made entirely of stone, which he, his brother Abel, and others quarried from East Rock. After quarrying the stone, Lanton floated the stones downriver into the harbor and placed the stones into position, doing so in inclement weather and often by moonlight. Lanton's construction made it possible for cargo ships to stay in deeper water and for merchants to unload their cargo directly onto the wharf rather than have to transfer items to smaller boats, which would have to row in closer to shore. The construction of Long Wharf had direct positive results for New Haven. William Lanson had become prominent for his building achievements and won the esteem of the city's elite. While working on the wharf extension, President Timothy Dwight of Yale praised William and his brothers, calling them honorable proof of the character which they sustained, both for capacity and integrity, in the view of respectable men. Around this time, William Lanson was serving and developing New Haven's black population, addressing their need for adequate housing, employment, civil rights, and education. William Lanson increased his real estate holdings, which he used to house indigent, sick, and fugitive enslaved black people who had fled the South. Lanson's leadership and devotion to the black community throughout the state earned him the elected ceremonial position of black governor. William Lanson's engineering feat at Long Wharf drew attention from city leaders and enabled him to obtain more contracts for both public and private jobs, the largest being the contract to build the retaining walls for the New Haven portion of the state's Farmington Canal. James Hillhouse, the project superintendent, hired Lanson, who employed a team of 20 to 30 free black men to construct 30 miles of the canal basin. For this project, Lanson quarried his own stone from East Haven's Blue Mountains, although he completed the job at a personal loss of $2,600, William Lanson was able to pay all workers in full. In addition to engineering and real estate, William Lanson was involved in many business ventures. Lanson owned a fancy carriage making business, two livery stables that consisted of 40 livery horses and carriages, he rented houses to 20 small families and owned a boarding house that housed five families. Lanson owned a goods store, a hotel with $1,000 worth of fine furniture inside. He owned an oyster business and a business relating to sailboats. The larger Lanson family owned a dry goods store, a stone quarrying business, and a clothing store. Sadly, William Lanson's hard work and outstanding achievements were besmirched, and his life spiraled towards ruin. Lanson's success Covering of his prime real estate and changing socio-political attitudes towards his activism caused him to be targeted by wealthy businessmen, local government, and the press. Lanson was constantly harassed by neighbors and police and repeatedly hauled into court and fined. He was falsely imprisoned, swindled out of his land holdings, and left bankrupt, eventually dying in the New Haven Almshouse in 1851. William Lanson and his family wrote and published a true account of his life and character leaving a treasure for posterity. Throughout the city of New Haven, from Worcester Square to Long Wharf, Trowbridge Square to East Rock, touchstones of William Lanson's life can be found. Today, Lanson's legacy is thriving through the Dixwell Church, the Farmington Canal Rail to Trail Association, the Canal Dock Boathouse, and the newly erected William Lanson statue by the Amistad Committee in the city of New Haven. William Lanson's life is honored for not only being a builder of structures, but for helping to build the community, for helping to build the city of New Haven, and for helping to build the nation. Today, we officially name the Chamber's Community Leadership Award 
as the William Lanson Community Leadership Award. Special thank you to Charles Warner for narrating that story. And the story of William is a story we still see today. When people are given access and opportunity, they can achieve incredible things. When those ingredients are denied, it is nearly impossible to sustain success. Going forward, we will recognize individuals who received this award in William's name. It will serve as a reminder of him and his achievements, and also all of the achievements that have been lost, the wasted opportunities because of racism. It's still there, and the business community must stand up to create real opportunity and access for all. At the Chamber, we are just getting started. We have much work to do. We know we will do it with you. Thank you. Let me now welcome Paul Tita. He is the Vice President of Public and Government Affairs for Colmar Americas and American Green Fuels to award our grand prize. Paul, thank you for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. Good afternoon to everybody. American Green Fuels, first, we want to congratulate today's honorees. And I also want to thank the Greater New Haven Chamber of Commerce for having me present this sit, stay, and play prize. Now, I'm going to tell you a little bit about American Green Fuels and why it's important to choose biodiesel, choose American Green Fuels. American Green Fuels is located in New Haven and employs approximately 50 people, many of whom are veterans. When we undergo major maintenance or expansion process, projects, however, our sense it swells to more than 200 people from all around the state. We like to say we fuel the Connecticut economy. American Green Fuels biodiesel is special. It is the only biodiesel plant in the nation that holds certain environmental certifications. You, more, you will hear more about that in a short video that follows my comments. As American Green Fuels is good for the environment and good for the Connecticut economy, we encourage municipalities and consumers of diesel fuel to specify or purchase certified and environmentally validated biodiesel produced by American Green Fuels for on-road vehicles, for off-road equipment, and as a replacement for petroleum diesel in heating oil. So thank you for listening to this. Now here's that video I mentioned. and help your local economy by using certified and environmentally validated biodiesel from American Green Fuels. Biodiesel is a renewable energy source made from recycled waste products, such as used cooking oil, which is converted into biodiesel at American Green Fuels and then blended into your heating oil. Biodiesel burns cleaner even in your current oil burner. So ask your oil retailer for biodiesel produced by American Green Fuels. You are what you heat. Okay, I hope you found that informative uh, and that you choose American Green Fuels Biodiesel. So as promised, the Greater New Haven Chamber of Commerce is proud to announce its grand prize package, Sit, Stay, and Play in the New Haven region. The package includes the following. Ergonomic office chair, an ergonomic office chair, donated by Transfer Enterprises for working from home comfort. A one night stay at the Homestead Madison which is a value of $350. A one night stay at any Omni Hotel in the US donated by Omni New Haven Hotel at Yale that opened its doors again last month. The Omni has undergone renovations to its grand ballroom, conference rooms, and hotel rooms. The grand prize package also includes a $240 value to tour the following local area restaurants. Almo's, Home, South Bay, Donalicious, Jack Steakhouse, and Guilford Mooring. To win this prize, I'm gonna ask a question and the first person to answer in the chat box will win this prize. Unfortunately, if you're an employee of the Chamber of Commerce or the state of Connecticut, you are not eligible. Here's the question. What key message is American Green Fuels asking you to take away today? Good luck and thank you for listening. Okay, so I am monitoring the uh, chat box. And let's see, we've got, all right. Um, uh, so we do have a winner and uh, I'm gonna try to make sure I get the right person here because it's exploding, but we did get it. And Paul, thank you so much for putting that out there. Uh, Tamika, actually, maybe you can help me and find it because I, I want to say that the one is, oh, I just saw it. I believe we've got, 
it looks like Andrea Kobachs. Yep. Okay. Great. Well, we will uh, we'll make sure that that's Andrea, and we will uh, sort all of that out. Um, we just got to make sure the uh, because the uh, terminology was uh, choose biodiesel, and so we will confirm that and make sure that we get it to the appropriate. Winner. I want to thank everyone who has uh, been with us today. We, we appreciate uh, you spending so much of your time with us. Uh, this has been a great program and I especially want to thank the chamber staff who has been working hard behind the scenes to make all of this work for you. Uh, it takes a lot of uh, technical assistance um, and also Olivier Pognon who uh, put together that William Lanson video and also the video that started us off. Thank you again to our sponsors and everyone who made a donation to the chamber today as well. Um, we have a list of restaurants that are here on a slide uh, in front of you. These restaurants are offering specials to anyone who attended the chamber's annual meeting today. All you have to do is go to them tonight and mention that you were at the chamber annual meeting and they will give you uh, the discounts that are listed here. And please support all of our restaurants in our region, all of our small retailers uh, that are here, our hospitality segment, uh, definitely needs your support. The pandemic continues to bring new challenges and perhaps the most difficult part is we don't know when we will be done with this. The award ceremony is always one of our best events. Everyone leaves impressed, inspired by the honorees, and my hope is that despite all of the challenges that we face, that you still feel that same way today and you walk away here believing in our business community. Our business community has been devastated, yet it has shown that it will persevere. We hope to see you again. Our next major event is the Big Connect. It's happening in November, again, virtually. Uh, we do have virtual uh, booths uh, available for it. And please take a look at the program that we had today that we mailed out to everyone. Um, thank you to everyone who is in that program. And we are starting to accept nominations for the Nonprofit Stars Align Awards. Thank you to everyone and have a great evening.